Welcome to the video lesson on cell transport. In this video we're going to take a look at three types of passive transport and three types of active transport. We're going to start with looking at passive transport. Let's start with what is passive transport. Pra passive transport is when a cell does not use energy in order to move materials. Three types of passive transport include diffusion, and diffusion is the process by which particles move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until the concentrations on either side are equal. This takes place in cells because cell membranes are semi-permeable. That means that it allows some substances to pass through and others to not pass through. If we take a look at some cell drawings down here, we have a couple examples where we can discuss diffusion. And our directions say, draw an arrow to show the direction of diffusion. Let's look at, start with our cell on the left. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 particles that are allowed to pass through the semi-permeable cell membrane on the outside of the cell. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of these same particles on the inside of the cell. So clearly there is a higher concentration of these particles outside the cell and a lower concentration of these particles inside the cell. Well, if these particles are able to pass through the cell membrane, that is, if the membrane is semi-permeable to these types of particles, then the uh, particles will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, and that, of course, would be in this direction right here. In our other example, over here to the right, inside the cell we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 particles, and on the outside we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So what this clearly means is we have a higher concentration of the particles inside the cell and a lower concentration of the particles outside the cell. So one of these particles would move outside and then what would happen, of course, is now there'd be nine outside and eight inside, so there'd be one particle constantly traveling back and forth because you have an odd number. Okay? But in the first step here, the diffusion would take place from inside the cell, from low, con I'm sorry, from high concentration to outside the cell where there is low concentration. Okay, let's next move on to another type of passive transport called osmosis. Osmo osmosis is simply a special name that applies to the diffusion of water. This would be when water moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until the concentrations of water are on either side of the membrane are equal. A question. Does water necessarily move from a greater volume to a lesser volume? And the answer to this question is no. The movement depends on concentration, not on volume. To give a great example, let's take a look at this video, which looks at the naked egg and the osmosis of water in and out of the naked egg in three or so uh, scenarios. Today on Sci Guys, Osmosis and Naked Eggs. Welcome to Sci Guys, I'm Adam. And I'm Ryan. Today we're going to be exploring osmosis through making naked eggs. Egg tastic! Egg salad! Excellent! Close enough. Osmosis is the tendency of water to move across a membrane from a dilute solution into a concentrated solution. The ingredients you need for this experiment are an egg, some vinegar, corn syrup, and food coloring. 
And the equipment includes a glass and an old spoon or gravy ladle. The reaction we're creating today isn't dangerous, but it's always a good idea to wear a lab coat or apron and goggles just in case of spills and splashes. The first step in our experiment is to take your egg and gently place it in the bottom of your glass. If you break your egg, you're going to have to start over again. Place it in the bottom, and then pour vinegar over top of your egg. The vinegar is going to remove the shell off the egg and expose the membrane. The shelled egg will need to sit in the vinegar bath for 24 hours. As our egg bathes in the vinegar, the shell is slowly dissolved. The bubbles clinging to our egg will cause the egg to float, flip, and turn. After 24 hours, you will need to drain the vinegar and replace it with fresh vinegar to continue the process of dissolving the egg's shell. Let the egg sit in the vinegar for another 24 hours. After that, the shell will be fully dissolved and the membrane will be fully exposed. Once the step is complete, pour out your vinegar into a sink, gently catch your egg, and give it a rinse. Once you have your egg removed from the vinegar, you'll notice it's grown in size compared to this raw egg. This is because water has flown from the vinegar into the egg through osmosis, but we're not done yet. The next step of our experiment is to place the, your naked egg into a glass, gently. Then, pour your corn syrup over top of it. Bend your old spoon and use it to gently submerge your egg into the syrup. The naked egg needs to sit in the corn syrup for between 24 and 48 hours. The spoon is used to forcibly submerge the naked egg under the surface of the syrup because the egg will naturally want to float. If the egg floats, the surface of the exposed membrane may harden and it will also cause this stage of our experiment to go much slower. Once this stage is complete, pour out your corn syrup using your hand to gently catch the egg and give it a rinse in the sink. As you can see, after a couple of days in our corn syrup, our egg is shriveled and small compared to the previous step where it absorbed a lot of the water from the vinegar. But we're not done yet. The next step is to fill a glass of water, add a few drops of food coloring, and give it a good stir. Now with your colored water, gently place your shriveled egg into the glass of water and leave it for a few more days. The shriveled egg will need to bathe in our colored water for about 24 hours. The egg will begin to grow and expand as the water passes through the membrane and into our egg. After 24 hours, pour out your water into the sink and gently catch your egg. Let's look at this experiment a little closer. First we need to look at why the shell of the egg is dissolved by the vinegar. Vinegar is made up of aqueous, or in other words, a water solution of acetic acid, and the egg shell is mostly made up of calcium carbonate. When we place our egg into the vinegar, the molecules in our glass cause a chemical reaction that produces carbon dioxide gas, water, and calcium acetate. Once the shell of our egg is removed and we have fully exposed the membrane under it, something really interesting happens. The water molecules in our vinegar begin to travel through the membrane of our egg and it begins to fill with water. The special thing about an egg's membrane is that it's semi-permeable. What this means is that it will only let specific molecules pass through it. In this case, the molecules it lets through are water molecules. When we place our swollen egg into the corn syrup, the opposite effect happens. The water travels through the membrane and into the corn syrup. This movement of water occurs because there is an imbalance in molecules. The corn syrup has very few water molecules, but lots of sugar molecules. The egg has lots of water molecules and only a few sugars, proteins, and electrolytes. All the molecules want to be in equal proportions on either side of the membrane. But remember, only water is capable of moving through the membrane. So instead, the water moves from where there's a low amount of other molecules to where there's lots. This means that the water leaves the egg and goes into the syrup. As the water molecules leave our egg, it shrivels and shrinks. When we place our shriveled egg into the colored water, there's lots of water molecules, but nothing else outside our egg. Inside the egg, there's almost no water molecules and very few proteins, electrolytes, and sugar molecules. So once again, the water moves through the membrane to the inside of the egg, making the proportions of water to other molecules equal, which in this case causes the egg to swell. The process of water traveling back and forth through our membrane to create our different stages of eggs is known as osmosis. Well, that's it for osmosis. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions related to this experiment or about science in general, feel free to drop us a message on Facebook or a comment below. We'll try to help you out as best possible. Thanks for watching. Bye. Here at Sci Guys, we're always curious how experiments turn out. So if you do these experiments at home, record them and submit them to us as a video reply to this video.
but remember, always get your parents' permission before you submit any videos to YouTube. Now that was pretty nifty, wasn't it? Our third type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, materials still move without using energy, but can only move through what are called protein channels. Let's now take a look at three types of active transport. Well, if passive transport was when a cell does not use energy in order to move materials, active transport is going to be when cells use energy in order to move materials. In, in active transport, you can even move materials against high concentration because the cell is using its own energy to move the materials so it can do that. Our first type of active transport we're going to take a look at is the protein pump. A protein pump uses chemical energy to pump ions across the cell membrane. These ions tend to be calcium, potassium, and sodium ions that are typically moved. In our diagram here that's included in your notes, you can see that our potassium ions are denoted by a yellow uh, ellipse oval and that the sodium ions are depicted by this orange pentagon. Well what you can see here is that the sodium ions are being moved through this protein pump right here and expelled into the outside area, the extracellular space, which would be outside the cell, from the intracellular space, which is inside the cell. Same thing going on here with our potassium ions. Okay, You can see that these potassium ions are being brought from the outside of the cell and expelled into the inside of the cell using these protein pumps. These protein pumps are embedded within the cell membrane of the cell itself. The next type of active transport we're going to take a look at is endocytosis. Endo is a prefix that means in. So this is bringing particles into the cell. The cell membrane forms a pocket around a particle outside the cell the pocket pinches closed on the inside of the cell, forming what is called a vesicle. And then the vesicle breaks loose, bringing the particle into the cell. A neat diagram here showing endocytosis, where we have these green particles outside the cell coming into the beginning formation of a pocket here. The pocket pinches off and then moves inside the cell and therefore has brought this green particle now into the cell, therefore being an example of endocytosis. The other type of active transport would be the opposite of this, which is exocytosis. And if endo means moving it in, exo means bringing it out. So it brings the particle out of the cell. The vesicle inside the cell carries a particle to the cell membrane. The membrane of the vesicle sticks to and becomes part of the cell membrane. An opening forms and the particle is forced out of the cell. A nice diagram. This is also included with your notes. Here we have material that is to be excreted, removed from the cell, this vesicle comes up, joins onto the cell membrane, and becomes part of the cell membrane. And then it opens and expels the secreted particles out to the outside of the cell. Nice example of exocytosis. That'll do it for our video lesson on cell transport. More to come on this as we look at some questions in the book and also discuss it. Uh, the various forms of cell transport in other scenarios in class.